Welcome to the Cape and Islands podcast, where we cover local people, their stories, important community topics, some interesting visitors, a little bit of history, but most importantly, we work to build a stronger community. Today I'll be speaking with Michael Jones, sometimes better known as Judge Jones. We'll primarily focus on today's topic of artificial intelligence and the implications on copyright law. Michael has been a U.S. Circuit Judge, a Chief Olympic Judge, he has qualified for the Olympic Trials in Swimming, just happens to be friends with Michael Phelps and also swam with Mark Spitz. He's on the Regional Council for USA Swimming and is an accomplished champion triathlete. He was also a regular on Emily Rooney's Greater Boston as a legal commentator. To say that Judge Jones has a plethora of experiences is an understatement and it would take me a lifetime to tell you all the details of his accomplishments, so I hope to have him back someday. So please enjoy the vast insight that he provides in this episode, and thank you so much for listening. All right, welcome Michael Jones, the judge. Happy to be here. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation, and uh, there's so much that we could talk about, but today we're going to try to focus on just one of the things that you're good at, uh, which is law. And uh, But before we even get into that, I just always ask folks, you know, what brought you to Cape Cod? What do you love about Cape Cod? Like, how did you get here? Yeah, the water. It's, it's pretty simple. Uh, I, I came here, uh, actually, it was, it was a good friend who was the, the father of a couple of swimmers that I that I had coached uh, back in the day. And both of them were pretty good, Olympic trial level. And uh, the dad was looking for um, a place, a second home. And mm-hmm. lived in uh, just outside of Boston, like so many second homeowners. I came down with him and fell in love with the place. This is the late 1980s. And he bought in probably 86. And then I bought in 1987. And I bought a place that I, that I could see the water. And that yeah. which was important to me. And to have access to the water. And as you know, the town of Orleans is terrific because we only have like five miles or so between the Atlantic and uh, Cape Cod Bay or Skakit Beach, as I like to call it. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. And I know you swim all the time with your wife. and uh, All the time. As, yeah. You know, I, I'm impressed at how cold it is sometimes when you're like, we were out swimming. And I'm like, okay, yeah. guys, yeah. you're yeah. committed. Um, <laughs> when you own 43 wetsuits as we do you're committed yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and here's the reason why is that when people come visit they'll say oh i don't i didn't bring a su- oh no 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 you don't have to have a suit because we have a suit to fit you and we got we one. have suits to fit every size <laughs> that's awesome well that's a great host right there um all right cool so we'll we'll get right into it um we, we've talked in many different conversations over the years of knowing each other about a lot of different topics, but AI has been something that we've discussed in the past. And since you have a background in law, you've been a circuit judge in New Hampshire. You've gone to a variety of schools. I'm talking, so we have, I, I won't read them all off, but Harvard, Miami Law is where you got your official law degree. Mm-hmm. Um, also got a Harvard Law and Museum Masters, the Warren School MBA, I, I, the list. I mean, we're going to do other episodes together, but the amount of places that you've gone to school and gotten prestigious degrees from is is sort of nothing I've ever heard of before. <laughs> um, but you should know I'm the poorest person that ever has a JD MBA from Ivy League schools. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Cool. Fair, fair. Um, so you, you know what you're talking about in all capacities when it comes to the law. And, um, and we were talking about copyright and we know that AI is, it's, it's threatening copyright in a lot of ways. And sort of what piqued your personal interest in, in AI copyright law and you started studying it and yeah. yeah. Well, uh, for, let me correct you. I, I, I'm not the person that knows everything. And in fact, I thought I knew a lot about copyright law because I've written a lot of books and, and advised a lot of people on different copyright issues, museums and artists. And last November, almost a year uh, to the date, I attended a Supreme Court hearing involving uh, the estate of Andy Warhol, the Andy Warhol Foundation. Mm. Real briefly, um, you know, Warhol is known for exotic sort of silk screens that give new meaning to whoever the subject is, from everybody, from Jackie O um, to Mao Tai Singh, all kinds of politicians, celebrities, Elvis, etc., and uh, he was given a photograph by a woman called uh, Goldsmith who took a photograph of an unknown artist by the name of, became known as Prince in 1981. 
And she licensed that photo to uh, Vanity Fair for 400 bucks in 84. Vanity Fair gave Andy Warhol that photograph. It's a black and white, simple photograph, a little more exotic than a driver's license photograph, but not a whole lot more, not much style or substance to it. And uh, Warhol did what he did. He made 16 colorful silk screens. Remember, this is 1984. It's in, in the magazine. Mm -hmm. 2016, Prince dies. Vanity Fair, Condé Nast says, oh, we're going to have a special issue, and we're going to put the Andy Warhol orange Prince image on the cover in the magazine, not the Goldsmith, black and white. And she finds out about it for the first time. We're talking between 81 and 2016. Demands off the record a million dollars from mm. the Andy Warhol Foundation. Warhol since passed, and obviously Prince had passed. That was the reason for the commemorative issue. And they say, no, this sue. And goes to the Supreme Court. I attended the hearing. My wife and I had front row seats. Amazing. And I said, there's no way <laughs> this court is going to grant Lynn Goldsmith the right, the copyright in whatever Warhol did. And shockingly, and I say shockingly, seven to two, the Supreme Court said, well, you know what? Both of them were used in a magazine. Therefore, Warhol does not get the fair use protection. And he violated a copyright because it's like a derivative right. She could have done that if she wanted to and didn't. Shocking decision. Mm. Sending waves throughout Everybody in every community who has anything to do with copyrights, whether it's musicians who sample somebody else's work right. or visual artists, screenplay people, on and on and on. So how is this all connected to, you know, how is the law connected to AI? I think, th I think what's important for your listeners to understand is the law, in a sense, is just about boundaries. Mm -hmm. It's society culture saying, okay, what is okay and what's not okay? And these boundaries shift all the time. The law is usually two steps behind new technologies. Perfect example is the internet. When the internet's, you know, fairly recent phenomenon. Right. And if you go back to the 1990s, um, nobody thought that there would be such a thing as social media or you could buy merchandise online. Um, people started to be used the internet. There was less than 9% of the U.S. population in the 1990s. They used the internet for anything as a means of communication, to buy things, to, to sell things, as the case may be. And um, there were instances where some of these um, internet service providers got sued for content, defamatory content. The mm -hmm. defamation deals with reputation. So we put boundaries on trying to protect people's reputation. So if you say something false about somebody and it damages their reputation and they can prove it, it's actionable. If you're a public figure, celebrity politician, the standard is higher. You have to show that the person who published that, publish means speak or write to more than one other person, more than the person you're addressed to. You have to show it was done with actual, with malice, a reckless disregard for the truth. So these internet service providers said, this is crazy. We, we can't afford all these lawsuits. So Congress passed a statute. This all relates to Section 2, the, uh, to AI mm -hmm. called Section 230. And it said any internet service provider or social media provider online um, has complete immunity from anything and everything. And that means Twitter, X as we now know it, and yeah. Facebook and Instagram and TikTok have absolutely... No boundaries or regulations set by us, the community, government, only whatever regs they establish that basically Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg control our universe of social media. Mm -hmm. All right? So why is that important? Because AI is the next generation. You know, if we talk about the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution and the digital revolution and the internet and the World Wide Web, artificial intelligence, which is machine learning driven by data and algorithms, is that next revolution. And there are no rails on it. Right. There are no rails. And why do we know? Because we've had very few case law on it. But the U.S. Copyright Office ruled that whatever content 
is generated by Google Bard or ChatGPT is not copyrightable. Hmm. So you say, wait a minute, what is it then? Right. You know, who owns it? Right. And think about this. As you know, that the way artificial intelligence machine learning works is it processes everything in the internet. It processes all the data. So more communications that we have, more songs that are inputted on Spotify or Amazon or Apple, all that content is available to AI. And then if you ask it to do something, you know, create a set of lyrics for these chord progressions, it'll do it. But what it's doing is mimicking something that already exists right. in, in, the, in the world of the web. And is that original? And that's what I think the courts are going to have to deal with. Somebody's got to have some rights here. I mean, we've had, you know, we've talked about defamation. We've had people that have been defamed by artificial intelligence, what they put out and then gets published. Well, what relief does that person have? Right. I just saw uh, to that point, I just, the deep fakes and also now the, the, the images, uh, video images of politicians mm -hmm. specifically that you'll see a lot of right now um, on a woman's body, for instance, and it's a male politician saying something because the AI is mimicking the voice mm -hmm. also of that person with a script that says something they would never say and they're being defamed. And, and if you look at this, this creation, mm -hmm. it's insulting. It's everything wrong about the internet, yeah. but who is, and again, section 230, which I do know a little bit about kind of allows for social media to exist, but also if, if let's say Facebook or Instagram or TikTok had to actually regulate what gets posted in an instant, mm -hmm. you got to wonder, I mean, mm -hmm. then they'd have to shut down because they'd get sued every two seconds. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I, I think, you know, the, it's off a little bit to the subject, but what is truth? How do we know what truth is? How right. do we verify truth? And, and, you know, I spent a lot of years as a trial court judge, and, and, um, and I'm a visual artist, too. You know, I paint. I've done posters for the Olympic Games, five of them, I think. And um, truth has a lot to do with perspective, you know. Right. <laughs> What's your viewpoint? You know, where are you standing when you think you observe such and such? But in, now with AI, how do we know what truth is? Because think about this. If we're looking at the, the, the collection of all the data that's available in the World Wide Web and algorithms that show our preferences, well, if your preferences are you're looking at things that are not particularly accurate, or maybe even false, or have a particular bias, maybe a gender bias, uh, wow, it's just going to keep on because... It looks for patterns. It's just going to keep on repeating that. So right. that bias gets repeated over and over and over again. Yeah, it does. And and it, it's sort of a black hole is what Sam Hollander and I were talking about in the music thing because you just it's iterative and it's over the same data and now it's going to iterate on its own iteration. <laughs> you know, it just becomes the single... At one point, it's going to become one thing. Um, but... We talked about this, and I think it's a good idea. So if anyone's listening, somebody should do this. Uh, I mentioned to you, I was thinking, like, we should create a certified human-made agency. Like, there's non-GMO, and there's these other things. But here's the thing. Like, you kind of need, like, a real versus fake police, but mm -hmm. what agency could ever, at scale, do that for the world? Mm -hmm. But we kind of need that now because tomorrow there could be a video of anything going on that mm. might trick the world. Um, and that goes like wildfire, which the way communication happens. How are we going to know, especially in a year when this thing is so much further ahead, mm -hmm. how are we going to know what's true? Mm -hmm. And now that everyone's going to start using AI to research, mm -hmm. now it's, well, what is it even saying is true? Like mm -hmm. you, you have to, you know, I've used chat GPT a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm pretty familiar with it. Um, and I, I find some things it can do really well. It can do create computer programming really well. It can answer um, medical exam questions really well. Mm. It can write college essays really well. So good luck to the educational community reading high school kids' essays because most of them are going to be run through ChatGPT, and, right. and they sound and they and they sound, you know, really really good. But 
for instance, on the Warhol case, the copyright infringement case, I've run that through ChatGPT, and it gives me the wrong answer, okay? Mm. So you're right. We need to have some verifiable standard. But just let's look back what just happened a couple of weeks ago in Gaza um, mm -hmm. yeah. with, the, with the hospital that literally right. dozens of kids were killed. The immediate reaction was, well, it probably was a missile from Israel. Mm. Then, as the U.S. does its investigation, of course, the Palestinians run with this, and the Middle East said, yeah, Israel bombed the hospital and killed 20-some children. Our investigation says, you know what? I think it's a rocket propeller by Hamas that went off improperly and did it. Which is, which is right? Who do we believe? We don't know. How do, how do we do it? Uh, how do we test it? And you, we need to have some standards. Um, I don't know the government's particularly good at it, but mm -mm. somebody's <laughs> got to step in, and I'm not sure I want Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg no. being it either. <laughs> no. Uh, That's why you need to have, like, a nonprofit certified human-made, like, yeah. certified truth yeah. or something. But then at, at this point in time, it's almost like anybody who puts their neck out to try to do something good is just going to get ripped down. Yeah. So it, we do need something like that, especially going into 2024, where the truth like it sure exactly yeah. and you know let let's go back to a couple uh, you know pre previous history we talked about different sort of revolutions <clears throat> including the industrial revolution and there's a guy named george muser who's a physicist who has a book coming out in a couple of days or weeks um it's about physics and about systems and about ai in particular and he tells a story about the steam engine um and the steam engine when it was initially in invented was really used to pump water out of mines and then it became an incredible force for power for industrial revolution including in locomotives and the brits were all excited about that and parliament was really happy and a whole bunch of parliamentarians went to watch this steam engine locomotive come down the track and they didn't realize it couldn't stop wow. we're that way with ai right. we have set this in motion and it's just going to build upon itself and we don't realize it can't stop right? <laughs> unless we somehow put brakes. And as you point out, who is going to put those brakes on? Well, and that was a question I, I had for you. Do you think our government is doing enough, but also do they even have a clue? I mean, at this no, point. No, 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 absolutely. They don't. I, I mean, you know, we, we don't have to get into the politics of what goes no, on I know, but... representatives. And even Justice Kagan, um, there, there were two cases uh, this last term that dealt with section, one of them dealt with section 230, the other was related to it. And, and she made the remark that she said, listen, we're not exactly the nine people you want to ask anything about the internet because we barely use it. Uh, <laughs> we use the old text. Yeah, we use the old text. Yeah. Right, right. You the know, Constitution is kind of our thing. Has the digital revolution <laughs> happened? We don't know. You know, they, they live such an isolated life. And maybe if they have grandkids, they can learn a little bit from their grandchildren. No, and I, the executive branch can't do it by executive authority. And Congress, well, you know. They, but that, that's sort of, a, and I know it's, it, you know, no matter which party anyone's in, I feel like we're behind the eight ball on this whole thing. You know, the eight ball is going towards the corner pocket and we're just like watching it go, about to go down. And, mm -hmm. and there isn't any, I haven't seen any major regulation coming through. Mm -hmm. I, I did read, uh, there's, a, there's a congressional research service. Um, they say that they've been informing the legislative debate since 1914, which you could argue might mean that they're not doing very well. No, I'm just kidding. But um, <laughs> they did speak about AI programs and about, uh, here, here's what they said. And I'd like your opinion on this. Um, AI programs might infringe on copyright by generating outputs that resemble existing works. Under U.S. case law, copyright owners may be able to show that such outputs infringe their copyrights if the AI program both, one, had access to the works, which we know most of it between like mm -hmm. until 2022 or so is up on ChatGPT. So that's number one, ha had access to their works. And number two, created substantially similar outputs. Mm -hmm. I mean, who's going to judge? Well, that's why you're here. No, that, that's what. No, there. I think that's going. I I think that's a fair assessment of what the next step is. There are enough artists in the music business and the fine arts business who know their works have been mimicked. Right. Uh, and um, we know if their work is online, it's part of the database. Right. And if it sounds like and looks like, 
And remember, it is we're just not talking about lyrics. We're talking about mimicking voices. You know, it's a right. great case with Drake. Um, yeah. that it fooled half the world. They thought it was an, a new song by by Drake. No, it wasn't a new song by Drake. And so, but those cases are just working their way through. And remember, they're before federal judges who, for the most part, you know, this is all new territory. Sadly, don't use the internet, it sounds yeah, like. <laughs> you know, all new territory to them. Now, I, and I, you, I think you're also on to something about third parties. So, for instance, there are institutions like hospitals that um, use AI. Let me give you an example. My wife and I were visiting her brother and his wife in Vancouver Island last spring. Neither one of them had ever heard of AI or ChatGPT. So I, I said, let me give you an example. Let me open up mine, and I'll show you something. And I said, let's take, take one of your patients. She's a, PA, she's a PhD physical therapist. And um, let's put the symptoms in and then ask AI, what's the treatment plan? Mm. She does it for a real patient, not the name. The treatment plan is exactly what she had developed, which took her days. Yeah. The next morning she woke up and told us, I did not sleep all night. I took every one of my patients, put in the symptoms and asked for the treatment plan. Every treatment plan for every patient, and she's head of her section there, was almost identical to what we have spent countless hours doing. Okay. Mm, yeah. It's effective. All right. I'm going to tell you what some hospitals are doing. Some hospitals are partnering with other AI companies to have a secure system. In other words, that kind of information about a patient's symptoms only stays within a closed loop and doesn't go outside to the World Wide Web. Mm. So I think different industries, different companies are going to do that, have a closed loop AI system. The other thing, um, some, some folks at Harvard and Stanford um, uh, created what's called, in copyright world, called the Creative Commons, where folks can, um, who have cop work that is copyrighted and copyrightable, um, can submit it and say, th this is free. This is for the public domain. I just want some acknowledgement. We could do some of that for artists who are willing to have their work part of the collective. But to your original example, I, I think that um, that's a legitimate cause of action against uh, whoever we decide the creator of AI is. And it's, you know, for ChatGPT, it's going to be OpenAI. For, for BART, it's going to be Google and go down the line. Well, and so I, I started up with MidJourney last year on Discord, mm -hmm. and I looked at the copyright part of their agreement, and it said that I, I own it. Well, this is probably been updated, but at the time it said that I own it, but also they own it. Mm -hmm. So we both had a copyright. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, that's sort of interesting that you're going to maintain a copyright, but so do I. But at this point... Now I think that's going to be challenged yeah. because all of that was built on other people's work. Okay. And, mm -hmm. and you know, how do you determine it? Here's, here's what in, in the further detail of the congressional research service document. Uh, and this came out September, 2023. Uh, the, the first part is that the plaintiff ha has to try to improve or sorry, it has to prove the infringer actually copied their work, which again is is having it in the database for the AI to re, to review is the proof that they would need there on on the first one. The second one, the substantially similar, it is so subjective, and one of the points that it makes is quote a, a substantially similar total concept or feel, which feel okay, well that's tough, overall look and feel again. Uh, or that the ordinary reasonable person would fail to differentiate between the two works. That one scares me a little bit because you could get something that feels a lot like something that a uh, different artist did, Salvador Dali, let's say. Um, but it doesn't actually mimic the original work. It It's very different, but it's, it's a very clear Salvador Dali ripoff. Mm -hmm. So, but who is... To the judge. Okay. Who's the judge of that? Okay. Let, let me, um, it's interesting you talked about mid-journey because ChatGPT says that, that if I sort of upload something for them to work on, that they own what I uploaded as well as the outcome. Chat, chat, it's what you typed in. Yeah. They oh. say they own that. Now, you think you may own it, but they say it's ours. And the output that you're asked us to produce, whether it's musical lyrics or a composition for um, Vanity Fair, 
that that's ours too. That's what they say. Just because they say, it. let's go, let's talk about. Wait, it. so they have the copyright. They say they own it. Yeah. So let's say when, I did. Uh, when, when, go ahead. Now, now remember, the copyright office, not a court, the copyright administrative office said there is no copyright from the output of ChatGPT. It, it just it can't be. But let's let's talk about the elements of a copyright, which are a little different than what that legislative group recommends. And I I like the existing statutory law. The statutory law says to get a copyright, first of all, it's got to be a subject that's copyrightable, lyrics, right. sound recordings, you know, poetry, all that good stuff. It's got to be original, all right? It's got to be original. Can't be, you know, plagiarized. It has to be, has some element of creativity produced by the human hand. And this is where the U.S. Copyright Office, I think, got it wrong. Because they said, whatever somebody had uploaded, I think that's part of the human hand. For instance, I, I teach at a law school. Yeah. And uh, the students, they have a final project. And some of them are doing stuff on AI and some on collective bargaining agreements in the entertainment industry, et cetera. I told all of them, and listen, I, I'm not a fool and I don't want you to be a fool. When you get out of law school, I guarantee you're going to be using AI. Yeah. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to run your paper through, through chat GPT or BARD, whatever you want to do, before you submit it. Don't run the whole paper through because it'll get all jumbled up. Run sections, you know, page one talks about maybe the introduction of whatever your subject is. And then I want you to compare and the difference. Here's what I don't want you to do. So that's the human element in my mind, all right? Mm. I've given you a draft and I'm asking you no different than Grammarly to some degree. Okay. I'm asking you to, to, to help with phraseology, maybe tighten my sentence structure, my tenses may be wrong. I, in my mind, that's the human element. Now... Here's, here's the other component. Um, you look at how much of the original work, the original, say, musical work, is in the final product, and how important is that mm -hmm. you know, to, to your remembering what the song is. We have lots of examples, you know, and especially in the music. Music has got so much of this stuff. So they look at, it's not just so much a quantitative, it's a qualitative stuff. So... And that's maybe the sound, the look, the feel that they're trying to get out. The, the statute right. defines it a little bit differently. And, and judges would prefer the statutory language because we've been working with it since 1976. Mm -hmm. So, and they look for consistency. So, is it original? What's the purpose and character of the new work with just chat GPT outputted versus the original stuff, music, lyrics, whatever it might be? How much, how different are the two? Are they so similar you say, yeah, that looks like the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then what impact, and this is critical, the fourth factor is what impact does the new work have on your market value? And As the original copyright as holder. As the original copyright holder. And the visual fine artists that have sued OpenAI argue that You've destroyed my market value. You don't need me anymore mm. because you can take my stuff and tell AI to create something like it in an impressionistic version, mm. and I'm sunk. Nobody's going to buy my work because you don't have to pay for this. Right. Oh, yeah. Graphic designers are, yeah. in, you know. Yeah. And, and you know, we, we talked earlier um, about off the record about writers and, and screenwriters and things of that sort. They're out of business. Yeah. You know, they're out of business. It's wild. Uh, so you remember the movie Alien? Sure. So Geiger was the designer. He did all the alien designs, and he's a really interesting artist that has this very specific style. There is so much AI because people are obsessed with that work. Mm -hmm. But if he was coming out now and he had just created that, he'd be, he'd be screwed. Yeah. Because all of that uniqueness is now infinitely reproducible mm -hmm. in, and, and you can say make that with an ad, make an elephant into a Geiger painting mm -hmm. and it just it is incredible how powerful it is um, and and that to me is you know what is a prompt engineer that's all of a sudden this new career out there like companies are hiring prompt engineers sure. and like their job is to like type in what the to get the best output out of this is that a career? I, I mean, I guess it's going to be, uh, but you got to wonder. But I do think that, that is, th there's severe impact on the livelihoods of those people. So the, the copyright uh, holder 
of the, let's say the original work, yeah, they're they're effectively getting infinitely ripped off. Absolutely. Now, let you t you asked about model. How do we regulate this? The EU um, and social media has just implemented a regulation, and the start of it literally was the uh, Hamas attack on Israel, mm. where under the EU regulations, um, when there are messages or images on social media, Instagram, TikTok, et cetera, X, that are false or likely to be false, you give notice to that social media. Oh, boy. And they have to remove it. They have to investigate it and remove it. Elon Musk was at a meeting last week about this. And he said, I want you to prove whatever those messages or images are, are false. So go back to the, the bombing of, of, the, of the hospital. Right. Who has proof which Who? way or another? And that's what Musk, that was his pushback. Notwithstanding right. the fact that he's talking to a regulator and they said, we're going to fine you if you don't move it. He said, no, the burden should be on you to prove it's false. I shouldn't have to prove what's true. So mm. whenever we create law, boundaries, we have to figure out who has to prove what <laughs> and what's the standard. Is it a reasonable person standard? Is it some? Is it preponderance of the evidence? This is the stuff that lawyers and judges love. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is, yeah, there's a lot there. Um, well, the thing that I'm hearing a lot now, too, is that the only way to beat AI is with a smarter AI, mm -hmm. and that effectively Elon Musk and all these, we're all going to have to put trust into this, like, so what is the certified hum, you know, human-made mm -hmm. going to be, who is going to be able to do that to the internet? Mm -hmm. Probably AI. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and then you say, okay, well, who's controlling that? And, exactly. right. and, and keep this in mind, especially with the deep learning, which is another element of AI, is that at some point <laughs> they may be able to create things out of whole cloth that hasn't been created. That's the direction. I mean, is it now? They're just moving stuff around that already exists. Right. But at some point, will they be able to sort of outthink us? Mm. Yeah. I think, I think if, that's happening now. And if you talk to the, <laughs> the ethical folks that are concerned about this stuff, um, it isn't just about truth. It isn't just about bias. But it, it, it's about our future and how do we fit into all this. Right. Well, and I think the, the real... There's a lot of people that are, are are speaking about it right now that have been developers in in AI, and what I'm hearing from them is that it's we're at the mercy already. It's over. Like we we have to just hope that it wants to be good to humans. Yeah, it, it's already out, yeah. and and it's already writing its own code, which was one of the founding principles that they said you had to leave an, leave an air gap from the internet until you fully understand it. And you also have to make sure it can't write its own code. Mm -hmm. Those were like two of the founding principles of like mm -hmm. the AI, original AI teams mm -hmm. that were out in the world that were all right. buddies. Right. And they failed at all. That. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, at this point it's out. And yeah. it, But maybe, you know, let's look at social media. There's no question Facebook is uh, for many people a, a way to communicate, to find friend group, to find relationships, to share images in life. But we also know, um, especially among teenagers and young women, that it has a super harmful effect on their sense of well-being and their mental health and creating anxiety and things of that sort. AI, I think, will do the same thing. I mean, it's going to automate a lot of things. There's going to be a lot of good that comes from AI, but there's going to be a downside. And how do we address the downside? Back to social media. This week, 41 states in the District of Columbia sued Facebook, Instagram for failing to protect teenage 13 and under kids who mm -hmm. are not supposed to be on some of these platforms, but they're failing to police it. I understand the difficulty of it, but at the same time, if you impose a duty and an obligation, you, you have to perform. And right. they've got algorithms out there, whether, whether they're humans that are trying to check each of these. And it's hard. I mean, you look at Spotify. There's 600 million subscribers to Spotify. How much music gets downloaded on a daily basis to Spotify. Well, you know what? 
smart people have got to create algorithms to be able to say, this sounds like some other song by whoever it is, Beyonce or Taylor Swift or Morgan Wallen, whoever your favorite artist is. It sounds like them. Right. So we're going to pull this aside. So we need to have smart people that create the algorithms to protect the copyright holders. You know what I just, I, as you're saying that, I had an idea. Um, so uh, YouTube actually does a really good, good job of copyright. And here's how they do it. Let's say that I make a video. If it's a commentary, then I can be monetized. I can make money on it as long as I'm commenting on someone else's work and the majority of the, of the work is my own creation. Um, so if it's news, I can comment on it. I can show clips even when it's full screen. I can still get full credit and, and monetize that and make money and add revenue off of that. YouTube does a great job with, with copyright because their algorithm picks up on the audio side. I'm not sure about text, but I know on the audio side, it'll pick it up quick. And, it, and it'll actually, when you load it, it'll say whether or not you're going to get a strike. And sometimes it still finds it later because somebody can put a strike against you if they mm -hmm. find it. But their algorithm is one of the most powerful full mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. So let's say I put up a video and it's just Purple Rain by Prince mm -hmm. and it's just the audio track. They'll be like, cool, all right, yeah, put it out there. No problem. You're not getting any money for it. Mm -hmm. And we're going to send that money that you generate with your channel to Prince as a mm -hmm. state sure. since he passed away. Right. Maybe that's the answer Yeah, that could be a model exactly but if we go back earlier times on youtube all they would do is send out cease and desist letters right they figured out we the record companies figured out sound recording companies we can monetize this right right you know, they're so, like yeah let that kid put it up exactly. we'll make the money <laughs> and you know, you know the latest thing is um and it's primarily on i think instagram and tiktok is that you have young people that are whatever their favorite Netflix show is, let's take, let's take Bear, you know, the cooking guy in Chicago mm. setting, TV, Netflix. They're creating trailers, and then they're literally a minute trailer as though it's a trailer for a movie, and then having their own text with some music of some hip-hop band or rap band that they like played over. I've watched a whole bunch of those. Every one of them looks like a copyright violation. Yeah, they, yeah. They have no permission for the music. All right, maybe the text is original, and I don't think it's a parody. But they're showing what the producers of Bear could show as a trailer, right? And it's running on Instagram and TikTok all the time, all the time. <laughs> well, the the amount of clearly copywritten things that's on Instagram, for instance, they've got a little better lot in the past year of taking down things like that. Cause I could make a video on my phone right now of us talking and I could put, um, the Beatles, you know, let's say any of their songs, you put that song up and you say, we're talking and it's playing in the background and then you let it play for another minute or so with like a video of something that is a hundred percent an audio copyright violation. Mm -hmm. You'll see that on TikTok. You'll see that on sometimes on YouTube, but YouTube's probably just demonetized it to that person. But Instagram, I don't think they do. TikTok is the greatest violator of this, even though you can add their music and it technically gets monetized to the actual artist. People put things up on there that are copyright infringements a hundred times a day, <laughs> like all the, all the time. And th the point is, I mean, they're not even a U.S. company, so they don't seem to care. Yeah. Chinese. Yeah. Um, but it does beg the question in terms of, you know, we, we need to, you know, protect the artist, the creator. The other aspect, which we haven't talked about, is another form of law that's related to the right to privacy. So privacy is this notion is that we have the right to be left alone and, and that nobody can intrude upon a reasonable expectation of privacy. But a subset of privacy is the right of publicity. And anybody who follows sports, college sports in particular, knows that there is now what's called name image likeness, that every college athlete can now monetize themselves Yay. without losing their amateur status. The pros have done that for years. Right. Olympic athletes couldn't do it for a while because they were then deemed to be pro if they took sponsorship money. That's been changed as well. Good. So if somebody takes your image or takes your voice and gets it reproduced to sound like not only, you know, are there copyright implications, but there are publicity right implications. Publicity rights are governed by state law. 
as opposed to copyrights that are governed by federal law and also international law. So we have lots of different kind of jurisdictions potentially at play here. The other thing is a thing called moral rights that exist sort of more outside the U.S. Than, than in. And moral rights are super important globally, especially in Europe, called the Berne Convention. And what they say is that nobody can claim ownership to your work that doesn't own it, that it wasn't assigned to or didn't buy it. Nobody can derogate or mutilate your work if it harms your reputation. So it's kind of a little bit of defamation. In the U.S. we have it, but it only applies to like fine art prints that are no more than 200 and have to be signed and, and numbered consecutively. So it's, it's a small sphere that it covers. But that concept of, of maybe somebody taking your voice or your likeness or your image and doing it without your permission and now claiming it to be you deep fakes kind of stuff mm -hmm. could be also a moral rights violation of publicity rights. And then we've got copyright issues as well. So if you add those up, so you could, here's, here's what, let's say a video goes viral of the video I was describing earlier, a male politician on a female's body using the male politician's voice emulated through AI. Mm -hmm. Let's say that, that they could strike that person for posting it on a morality mm -hmm. strike. Um, let's say it made a lot of money. They should be able to claim that money. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. So the the copyright, like what YouTube does, okay, pass that buck along to me now, mm -hmm. even though you violated my moral rights. So not only do I get all the profit you got, but I'm also going to sue you mm -hmm. for morality strike. And then the publicity, you might actually make an argument. They own, they, <laughs> they, should, they got some. I don't know if it's good, but the, it's interesting. And, and I did have a, have a question on the publicity rights. Why not make that a federal... If we have 50 laws or 51 or even more yeah, because of D.C. and Puerto Rico, I'm yeah, not sure. Yeah, it happened. And, um, you know, the publicity, we have to basically thank Elvis for publicity rights because what people were doing, um, uh, you, know, not, you know, not only claiming they, you know, had Elvis's baby after he passed, but, uh. you know, people using his music and, and, and uh, telling stories about him. And Tennessee, Memphis, decided, wait a minute, because what we thought was that whatever rights you have as an artist, copyrights last during your lifetime plus 70 years. But this notion of publicity rights, what were they and how do we establish them? And even if you have them, a right to privacy, for instance, how could you have a right to privacy after you die because, you know, you're no longer living? So states had to reexamine the privacy statute and create this publicity right to cover really with celebrities like Elvis and the voice of Frank Sinatra mm -hmm. and Ted Williams' DNA, things like that on a state-by-state -state basis. So the heirs to Elvis could monetize them. So to sort of put a pin in that and to describe it in a more layman way to, to someone like myself, if I'm an Elvis impersonator in Vegas, mm -hmm. Then I would have to, I presume, license the right to be an Elvis impersonator and give some percentage of yeah, the proceeds. Especially if you're singing his songs, yeah. But would you have to then give a percentage of your proceeds to the estate of Elvis? I, they certainly could claim it, absolutely. Now, here's the other thing. There's another element huh. to all this called parody. Because I was going to do that, and now maybe not. <laughs> called parody. So if you're Weird, weird Al Yankovic, you know. Oh, that's a whole thing, who, too. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, Michael Jackson has this, you know, famous video called bad and yeah. you know and it's part of a movie but the the part of it where he is in a garage and jumps and you know the bad guys on the other side jump and they all start singing together so will Dow yankovic very inappropriately does a video called fat right you know? I, oh, I've seen, i yeah. loved that video <laughs> so, um, now needless to say the jump is the best part <laughs> he, he didn't have permission for michael jackson so weird al has taken the position that I'm going to license anybody's music because I don't want to spend all my time in federal court. Right. You know? And so that is a position to take. But, but that, he could have used parody? He could use parody. And, and frankly, all his stuff probably qualifies as parody, right. but he just doesn't want to go to court and do it. Um, the, the, the leading case on parody, and, uh, and, and it was, it was um, a, an opinion written by uh, a former colleague of mine, Justice David Souter, who I have great admiration for, um, but I think he got the case wrong. 
So there haven't been very many copyright cases in the last 30 or 40 years. Um, the Warhol case, mm. and then before that, you go back like 30 years, and it was a case involving uh, Roy Orbison. So Roy Orbison sang this great hit song in the 1950s called Oh Pretty Woman. And a rap group by the name of Two Life Crew, originally out of California, oh, yeah. <laughs> moved to South Florida with Luther Campbell, who's a high school football coach now. Um, and they contact, Roy Orbison had died. His estate had the copyright. They contact the estate and said, we'd like to do our version of it. They said, send us your music. And they said, you are the last group in the world <laughs> that's yeah. ever going to yeah. be able to reproduce two live crew. They put out an album. I think there were 13 songs on it. What's on the album? The rap version of Oh, Pretty Woman. Right. With nasty lyrics. Yeah. It's not about the lyrics. It's about the melodies. It's yeah. about the chord progressions. If you put the song side by side, man, it's identifiable. Yeah. That is Roy Orbison's Oh, Pretty Woman, which they did in court. Justice Souter said that that was parody. That was a comedic commentary on a prior artist work. Wow. Now, I said privately to Justice Souter, I said, do you ever hear the whole album? So right. you're telling me one song out of 13 is parody. The other 12 are not parody, but that one is parody? Right. I'm not sure that's parody. However, that's the out. That's the fair use out. It's parody. So some of the examples you gave, somebody, you know, trying to mimic somebody else, and you say, oh, I'm, I'm just trying to comment, comment on somebody, a newsworthy thing. It's funny. Saturday Night Live. They make fun of everybody. It's all parody. Right. All parody. I always wondered how they don't get stuck with no, defamation all no. the time. And, you know, you know, the leading case was on the state of New York. All right. So the state of New York used to have a logo that said, I love New York. And it was like, I love New York in the summertime and somebody swimming in lake in a lake. I love New York in the winter. Somebody skiing in Lake Placid. I love New York, you know, in the fall, Broadway, on and on and on. So Saturday Night Love does a skit. I love New York on the subway and somebody's getting mugged. You know, right. <laughs> you know they go through all the seasons and the state of New York sued Saturday Night Live. Wow. Saying you're defaming us. And, and I said, no, 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 no. It's just parody. You know, like and, and the and also trademark violation because they used the state of New York's logo. All fair use, copyright, whatever language we used, you know, it's not defamatory. We're making fun. The First Amendment protects us. We're comedians. And that's so they gave up. Nobody sues Saturday Night Live. Wow. That's sort of interesting because I guess there's precedent. Or precedents yeah. in that now that they didn't win, that the state of New York didn't win right. on a blatant, you know, very clear rip off of their logo and their trademark. I was going to ask you, AI, and tr how much will it impact trademark? I, I do have a few copyrights and I've got one trademark. And I will tell you that they're... The trademark is is much more of a bear to manage than the copyright. The copyright stuff was somewhat easy. Mm -hmm. uh, trademark is is no fun. Um, <laughs> I would recommend getting a lawyer if you're going to do it. Uh -huh. Don't do it the way I did it because I tried it on my own and it worked, but not well. Yeah. Um, but trademark, do you think there's implications yeah, with AI? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Trademarks are hard because there's so many different classifications and you got to figure out where you fit with, yeah. within that regime. Um, copyrights are easy. You know, because you have a copyright the minute, you know, you whatever it is you create. You know, right. you know, you write it down on a sheet of paper, you type it out, whatever the case may be, or have an old Polaroid camera and it's on film, there it is. And however, it you know, your listeners may want to know this, that you can win a copyright case, but you can't win monetary damages unless you actually register that copyright mm. with the U.S. Copyright Office. Um so, yes, I've got a copyright, but being able to, you may be able to stop somebody from using it, but if you want to sue for money. Um, Can I just dig in on that? Yeah. So, in theory, let's say somebody, let's say I had a logo and somebody ripped it off, or let's say that I had a product somebody ripped off, easier for, for a copyrightable thing. Let's say it's a print that I made, and they basically ripped it off, sold it for six months out of that year they started selling it and made a million dollars mm -hmm. uh i never copyrighted it with or copyrighted right mm -hmm. with the with the federal government um so i can't sue them they can't now sell it because i'll win mm -hmm. 
because they did infringe on my inherent right. crop copyright, but now what about the sales that happen? Okay, good, perfect example. This is what happened with Lynn Goldsmith and Warhol. She never registered that photo, but once she saw it in, in Condé Nast in 2016, you know, the Warhol silkscreen image yeah. uh, uh, based on her reference photo, she then registered it. So her damages are from that point on Okay. After. So she can't collect any money. Nobody even knows where all these 16 silk screens are that Warhol did. Nobody even knows if they're still valid in terms of a copyright because clearly Warhol had a copyright when he did the silk screen. What the court said was the violation was because her photo was in a magazine and his photo was in a magazine. And Kagan, Justice Kagan in a dissent said, that's nuts. Listen, that magazine could have picked the black and white photo if they want. They didn't. You know why? Because it doesn't tell you anything about Prince. Warhol tells you everything you need to know about Prince. Right. He transformed the photo. That's fair use. That's always been fair use in America. And how the Supreme Court mucked it up, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So let me give you... I would actually... Uh, can you be on the Supreme Court? Because I think we need some help there. <laughs> yeah. So let me let me tell you about a, a guy that contacted me, uh, a guy out of Boston, and we got to go back to... Remember the Madoff thing? Oh, yeah. Where, you know, ripped off in a Ponzi Yeah, scheme. the major Ponzi scheme. Lots of Jewish families. Brandeis University almost went under. Mm. In fact, they, their museum, they threatened to sell all their art which was major litigation to raise money because, you know, they just weren't getting any charitable contributions. And so as a complete joke, this is an investment banker in Boston. As a complete joke, he made these signs, cash for your Warhol, and then without thinking, actually put his own personal cell phone number, call, all right? And he put these things, put them on stakes throughout New England. I mean, everywhere. He would drive around, just stake them in. Well, what do you think? People started to call. And he had to tell them, no, no, it's just a joke. I, wow. I, I'm not buying any Warhol. But here's what happened. A guy in California created a domain name, cashforyourwarhol.com. Mm. So he contacted me or I contacted I don't know how it went. Um, he, I don't remember how it went. But he said, what do I do? Um, right. And I said, well, you know, what we're going to do is cease and desist because, you know, it's trademarked. And he's using a domain name. It's cyber. It's against the anti cyber squatting law. And the whole nine yards. But this guy actually was trying to get people to sell Warhols on the cheap um, through a domain name, and people thought it was the Boston investment bankers' domain name, and it wasn't. He had nothing to do with it. So, and the guy closed it down eventually. Wow. Yeah. Ah, there's so much there. It's so fun. It's enlightening. It's we're we're right on the precipice, I think, <laughs> of just total chaos. <laughs> I mean, just, just, Clark, just don't leap. <laughs> right. I know. Well, it's. I think uh, let's find out if we'll have a soft landing on any of this. Well, I know that. So Getty Images. This is a big case with stable diffusion. Yeah. Um, they're suing because because you could type in the image that you want off of something that's currently owned by Getty Images and say, I want this man walking through a field with this dog, with this sunset, and it'll return almost the same image as what Getty Images has. And, and you can just nail it. And yeah. so that's the case. And they're suing. First, I mean, do you think that they'll win? Well, I mean, it's a tough question. I, I mean, Is it a copyright infringement? Based on what you've told me, it looks like it has all the elements. Because yeah, if yeah. you're a copyright holder, you have the exclusive rights to own it, to display it, to reproduce it, derivative right, to sell it, to assign it, or do nothing with it. Um, so if you own those rights and somebody is, you know, taking even, you know, three or four elements of your copyrighted stuff and put it together as one, that's not original. And that's a violation of your derivative right because, because uh, Getty could have done it. Perfect example is the Shepard Ferry case when, with the Obama photo taken by Manny Garcia, who was a freelance photographer for Associated Press. And as long, it, when, when Shepard Ferry and his wife put out the posters as a political statement, it was protected by the First Amendment. He didn't charge a dime for it. In fact, if you were a, a, a member of the Democratic Committee in Massachusetts, you got a free copy. Mm. Um, 
it just because it was a way to support President Obama. It didn't charge. And, of course, the whole world loved it. Um, and he did change it a little bit. I mean, he added color to the black and white, to the color photo. He cut out the, the, the really interesting thing is the assignment the, that Associated Press gave to Manny Garcia had nothing to do with Obama, who was an unknown senator. It was a guy sitting, sitting next to him, George Clooney. Oh. <laughs> but he, op- he opened up his lens and he got Clooney and Obama. Uh-huh. And this contemplative move, you know, mood looking to the heavens and the sky like, I could be president. Right. And he was. Yeah. And he became. And <laughs> um, so what Shepard did was download the photo he saw in AP, cut out George Clooney, did, did you know, Obama, enlarged it, colorized it, made a silkscreen version of it, and then put the word hope and stole the Democratic National Trademark seal committee put that on it too most people don't realize that that was a trademark violation oh. now and then he started charging tons of money and he put it on better paper woven woven paper and then he would sign it numbered and they got larger he made we believe hundreds of thousands of dollars and um instead of waiting for associated press to sue him he sued associated press to get a court to say this was fair use. Oh. This is not parody, it's fair use. And uh, um, in the course of the depositions, which are questions that lawyers ask the different litigants, mm. Shepard Ferry committed the major no haul, no, never do this before a judge, federal judge or any kind of judge, is don't lie. Mm. And he was asked, where did he get it? Did he get it on the internet? And he said, nope. And then the Associated Press got a court order to retrieve every computer that Shepard Ferrier's wife ever had. And sure enough, there the images were that Shepard had tried to delete but didn't know enough how to delete it. Oh, no. And um, he was going to get hammered by the court. And so he settled out of court for one year on his website, obey.com, obey.com, obey giant, um, that he had to post, I will never do this again. I will never s- steal somebody else's <laughs> licensed photograph. From now on, I will license, I'll pay a royalty, and um, paid a, you know, had to pay a bunch of money, I'm sure, to Associated Press for, um, for the use. And he made, it, he made lots and lots of money. So what's, what's incredible to me is that the AI systems now are doing that on steroids all day. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> wait, this poor guy, you know, and I mean, he did what it is almost, he, he did more to all alter that photo to make it into its own thing. Right. Than any of the so, AI so, artists. So, so keep this in mind. Um, if you're doing it for your personal use, yeah, it may meet the statutory definition of copyright infringement, but if it's for your own use, there's no harm. There's no damage. Right. There's no impact on market value. You can do that. It's when you put it in the public domain in some fashion, when you exhibit it, when you try to call it yours and you license it and assign it. That's where the trouble That's Hey, she- I told you, the Shepherd Ferry Hope poster example is perfect. Mm. It's political speech. It's First Amendment. You know, our, our copyright laws exist to encourage creativity and innovation. Right? Yeah. Now, you can disagree about the language and the stops and the, and the rails they put on it. But if it's just for your home use, you're, you're okay. It's when you upload it to someplace else and you show it to someplace else, you exhibit and call yours, that's where you get in, potentially in trouble. So it's interesting. It's not just trying to monetize the reproduction of that image or somebody else's work. It's really just putting it in the public arena. It's it's just putting it on display. Potentially, yeah. Mm. But, you know, you're some elementary school kid that does it. Nobody knows there's no harm. You know, it's when, you know, people monetize it, when the commercial element of it of it comes. That reminds me, there was a kid that made uh, like a meme uh, I think it was partially AI generated meme of his principal yeah. and got like kicked out of school and he was a kid though. Yeah. And he publicized it quote unquote by putting it on, I think Instagram yeah. and I think he got suspended and then the, there, there's, I, I'd have to look into it, but there's a whole bunch of litigation about it. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. So just publicizing it, even if you're a kid, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I do think of the, the whole, uh, the hope poster that everyone knows 
um, gets ripped off on on so many way in so many ways on so many AI. I mean, there's memes, there's everything, um, and you just gotta wonder. I mean, it, it's almost like there's just so much getting created mm -hmm. that there is no way to police it. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have to have a, an army of lawyers to go out there and fight all these cases. It's it's so hard. Um, I, I'll give you an example of of how I help somebody. Um, I, I don't know Missy Suicide. I don't know the Suicide Girls. I know of them and they're online and kind of racy clothes and non-clothes and <laughs> you could subscribe to Amy and, you know, right. Liz and some of the others and follow them and be part of their life. But um, there is what I refer to as a serial copycat artist named Richard Prince. He and Jeff Koons I put in the same category. So here's what happened. So this particular suicide girl has no money to her name whatsoever, um, had an Instagram photo. And then, it, you know, she's uh, hovering over a cat ball and there's something about cats, I like cats, and a couple other little lines. And uh, Richard Prince sees that, has his assistant download it, make it large, and all he did was add something like Richard Prince 123 at the end. Everything else is exactly the same. Her image, all her lines. And uh, Gagosian Gallery had eight or ten of them and sold them in Europe at 80 grand a clip. I think they sold ten. Don't correct me. Don't, don't, you know, I may be wrong. Because it's Richard Prince and he signs it. So I'm in communication with Missy Suicide, who I have no idea who is, and I said, listen, this girl's woman has no money whatsoever, right? Wow. Uh, let's do two yeah. things. At the time, I was writing for Huffington Post. They had me do stuff about sports, about culture, about art. So I wrote a blog, basically, for Huffington Post with what her Instagram photo and what Richard Prince did and talking about copyright violators and what rights creators have and these folks that aren't creative <laughs> trying to rip off somebody who can't defend herself. Right. But by the way... You know, it's a violation. It's an infringement. This woman had no money. She's not going to sue Gagosian or, or Prince in federal court. And then we had her reproduce them herself online and sold them for 100 bucks a piece. Those two things caused Gagosian Gallery to shut it off. I believe they had to repay, don't quote me, the folks that have bought it who now discovered they could have bought it for $100, not 80 grand destroy Prince's market for that. Now, Good. he still does it. I see stuff like Prince, you know, all the time when I go to museums in New York and other places, and Jeff Koons does some somewhat same. Um, so that's a way to backdoor it, and that was what, you know, somebody who spends, uh, has spent a lot of time in a courtroom, and I'm telling everybody that's the last place you ever want to be. So let's think, is there another way to attack this problem? Yeah, and we need to get to that soon as far as society because this is coming like a freight train, like you said. Oh. And, and wasn't in the original time you told me that story about the steam engine, weren't there people on the tracks? Yeah, that there was. Hit? A member of par yeah, they got hit and a member of parliament died. Yeah. Right, and they're they, like they, celebrating they, and they're they, like, yay, they, oh, wait, they, no. <laughs> there are no brakes, and that's AI. Right now there are no yeah, brakes. Yeah. You know, we're coming back to the steam engine. You oh, know, man. Industrial revolution. <laughs> now we're in another revolution. Yeah. It's It's wild. Well, I, ha I have uh, just a million questions for you. And again, I didn't even do any justice to who you are. And I'll try to do a better job having you back on because there is so much that you've done from sports to a million things in this world, from being a, a judge to being a phenomenal athlete. And we'll, we'll have you back <laughs> to talk about a lot of things. In this scenario, which could happen tomorrow, just an example of, you know, what could potentially happen. So um, let's say Michael Phelps, who you're friends with and were a mentor for, which, again, we'll get into in a, in a future episode, although I do want to ask you something about that at the end. Um, let's say that I today go on and I go on the AI and I say, okay, write a training program in the tone of Michael Phelps. So there's the text. Generate a video from the text. Uh, create the actor that looks similar to Michael, but not the same. Have the tone of voice mimic Michael Phelps. 
uh, create a website surrounding it. It can write the code. Uh, create clips for YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram. Write the marketing plan. Uh, and then also write the legal disc disclaimer that this is fair use. Mm -hmm. That what what's going to happen? Yeah. What happens? There's, there's a lot to it. So I mean, I mean there's a lot of in, in there. But. Yeah, there, there's a lot. So there are publicity rights. Um, you know, are you mocking him? Are you making him look heroic? Do you have him with his all his gold medals, whatever eight nine gold medals that he won in London? Um, so you know what what's the use? Uh, again, if if you just did all that and you did it for yourself, you're okay. But once you start posting it, now you're publicizing it, you're displaying it, and that's one of the rights that the original copyright holder has. So. We have to believe that we know that Phelps has the right to his image, his likeness, his voice. I'm not sure about the training manual. Um, if he's written one, and and I don't know that Michael has, although, you know, he has a book. I actually have a copy of his book. Uh, and he probably has some training schedules there. So let's assume you rip that off you right. know, and you incorporate that. Well, that was copyrighted because he's got the copyright to his book. So there are a whole lot of copyright violations, publicity right violations. Um, he has a business called MP, so why don't you throw that in? That's a trademark name. Uh, goggles and bathing suits and swimming gear and things of that. And and he's he's moved on from that to uh, to attire. In fact, uh, let me tell you. Uh, let me give. Uh, let me just tell you a side story about Michael Phelps. So you know he had a big deal after you know speedo in high school and beyond, and then Nike. He was a Nike athlete, and he talked. To, this is what Michael told me, you know, a few years ago, that he wanted to get involved in the creative aspect of his gear, kind of clothing, not just swimming attire, but post swimming attire, you know, attire, you know, that people would wear whether going to work or, or, or play. And Nike told him, we have people that do that. <laughs> and so he left. He said he created his own company. Nice. MP. There you go. And there you go. So, yeah, I think there are potentially a lot of violations in your scenario. You well, know what? You're going to keep a law office very, very busy. <laughs> <laughs> well, so here's, well, for Michael Phelps in that scenario, what would his, what would his most, and for anyone that sees this happening to a friend or somebody famous or just a regular person that is doing something cool that someone else is ripping off with AI, yeah. what would be their best recourse? Okay. So the, the, Presumably, you know, or you can find out who's doing the posting. So Hopefully. his Phelps's agent happens to be out of Portland, Maine. So he's going to contact him, and the Portland, Maine lawyer, he's a smart guy, big law firm up there, um, is going to find out who this person is, and inform him. Got to give him notice. Listen, you're not authorized to do any of this stuff. So we'd like you to take it down immediately. If you don't, we'll take appropriate action. And that is get a hold of TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, and all those other people. And then figure out what damages, if any, uh, to, to Phelps's reputation. So, for instance, if, if they um, depict Phelps in an unfavorable manner, you know, that's, now we're talking defamation. We're not just talking about... Mm you know, copyright infringements and trademark infringements. We're talking about publicity rights violations. We're talking about something. We have a whole bunch of stuff. Now, you know, if it's a 12-year-old girl doing this, good luck. But, you know, if it's a business, people trying to monetize or make people think that this is his business, a scam artist, you know, then you've got some real potential damages. I have so many questions on what you just said, especially, though, the first part about, well... Real quick on the 12 year old. I mean, this law is going to have to cover that because this stuff is so easy to, to do. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's going to have to cover anyone of any age. It's not like at 18 or over anymore because a kid, at a very young age, can make, could, could type that into mm -hmm. the multiple systems and make that. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is some consideration. I think that the whole judicial system should t evaluate that there is no minor in AI, mm -hmm. you know? 
uh, there's an IN team. No, wait, no, there's not an IN team. Um, so the other, <laughs> that was my dad's favorite thing. There is not an IN team, Clark. Um, <laughs> so, but, but dad, I squid the winning point. But I shot the, I shot the best, the best shot. Um, so, uh, but so the whole idea of you catch them, cease and desist, let's say they agree. Traditionally, in your experience, the money that they made prior is they're basically just going to keep unless you sue for it. Is that basically it? Correct. Okay. So otherwise you got to sue them. Otherwise you got to sue them. And I've, I, I think I've said at the beginning of this that the law is always two steps about behind the yeah. technology. I mean, we're maybe four steps. When we're, all the examples that you're presenting and things we're talking about, it's like, oh my gosh. And I'll tell you, their judges are not trained on this. One of the, the uh, my equivalent who's on this global tribunal that I'm a part of uh, is, is, is a judge from Scotland. And He's got really impressive resume, deals with really complex cases in their judicial system. He doesn't even use the internet. Mm. If he has even an email, his wife does it. Mm. Texting, his wife does it. We're trying to communicate with him, and he he just freezes up. Yeah. There are people like that. This is an esteemed judge, right? Right. <laughs> in high court. Yeah. That's afraid. Right. Afraid, afraid of this. Yeah. Can, can you, we're going to take him to AI. No. It terrifies him. Yeah. And, well, I think that's the thing. I mean, the Congress in general, the Senate is older, even, and not to be ageist, but a lot of this technology, the youth are younger than a lot younger than me are the sure. ones that are really in it. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't even venture a guess as to how to regulate this. Well, although I'm pretty connected to it and I've been trying to research it a lot, it's really the, it's it, it the people that are on the forefront are the eight to 16 year olds, you know, honestly, um, that understand it probably better than the people making it, you know, mm -hmm. um, because they use it all the time now. And, that's a part of their life. It's like, you know, they say you, you learn a language so quickly as a kid, you can learn seven languages easily as a kid because your brain's so malleable and you just, your brain right. figures it out. You can't do that as an adult. It just doesn't work. Well, that's kind of how it is with AI for these kids. Like it's a part of their DNA now. Sure. And it's already there. Mm -hmm. um, and they're going to be whizzing through. And I, I just wonder and, and sort of fear a future where everybody's a prompt engineer and that's yeah. all that we do. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and let's go back. What AI is? It's data, and it's algorithms, and it looks for patterns, finds similarities, and then it just repeats it. All right. We can't limit the data that gets exposed on the web, on the internet. Right. 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 So now we're left with the algorithms. So can we have smart people write algorithms that block some of this stuff, or at least put a strainer on some of the stuff? Yeah. Or back to my example of having a closed loop system. The closed loop system works well for business and industry because they can afford to do it. Mm -hmm. They can hire their own AI people and say, okay, we're going to do this because we have security issues here. We have privacy issues. You know, we all, yeah. you know, our medical records are electronic now and we know how many times has that been hacked. Yeah. Um, so let's just try to keep that internally. We're not even going to put that in a cloud. We're just going to keep it internally. We're going to, we're going to go back a little bit to old school. But doesn't the AI need to, in order to evaluate it, doesn't it need to it, have access? It, it has it has access, but the output, I think, is what they're trying to, I think they're trying to create a system that they can only, they will input their data only and not resource externally for systems on, let's go back to the patient with certain symptoms. Right. Okay. You know, we're a large hospital. We got thousands of patients coming in and out, you know, every week. So our system is only, we're, we're just going to focus on patient symptoms, potential treatment plans, likely outcomes within our system. And maybe we'll share it with another hospital and not go into the cloud. I think that's what some of these industries are trying to do. But that doesn't help the general public. That doesn't help the rest of us. I just had a really scary vision. So in five years, I bet that the human will be taken out of that scenario of a doctor's visit in, in, unless you need a physical test, right? So you go, there's a screen, there's a video doctor, and you say, here are my symptoms, and it gives you exactly what a human would have given you, maybe better, 
and then it sends your prescription out <laughs> and you never see a human again. <laughs> but seriously, I mean, that's sort yeah. of what we're looking at. No, exactly. And think of that. The half step we had was COVID and Zoom, you know, where we couldn't go to a doctor's office. So the doctor would be on Zoom. This is, this is just the multiplier effect. Okay. You don't even need a real doctor because right. the doctor's got all the medical charts and research imaginable and can probably diagnose your problem better than a doctor who than a human <laughs> that, that you've gone to an urgent care for the first time. Yeah. Um, because they've seen it all. Well, yeah, it's remarkable. So, I mean, yeah. Okay. We now, we, we now need fewer physicians assistants and doctors and nurse practitioners. However, technology may be able to diagnose and treat and provide you know, a plan to save our lives or extend our lives or make us better. So that's a benefit. So any one of these scenarios we have have benefits and they have potential losses and harms. And that's no different than the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, the electronic, the digital the internet. We could, we could claim the same for all of them. Mm -hmm. The good news, Clark, I'll tell you is, the Wall Street Journal did a piece of the New York Times about which jobs most impacted, and obviously it's automated jobs, and lawyers were going to lose the most, second most number of jobs. So there may be fewer lawyers or legal assistants. I don't know about that after this conversation. <laughs> well, yeah, you know what? You can, you can say create a will. Right. It'll create a will. But then don't you still, I, see, I think our role as humans now as subject matter experts or lawyers or, you know, it's going to be QC of the AI. Like that's our job now is to make sure the AI. So yeah. it's like, oh, you had the AI write your, I had a, I had AI write a contract um, for something and then I still ran it through a, yeah. a lawyer yeah, sure. to get like a stamp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and that's the verification that you're talking, that's the human side of it on, on the backside. I right? think you still need that lawyer, yeah, yeah, right? I, absolutely. Unless, you know, you're qualified enough that you can, be the verifier yourself. Negative, not on my end. <laughs> um, and uh, I thought it sounded great, though. <laughs> <laughs> it did. Well, Bobby saved you, you know, half an hour of billable hour time or for something sure, like that. Yeah, why yeah. not? Right, you, at least you had something to start with. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's so fascinating, isn't it? and it's you know, it's an interesting time to be alive and experience all this stuff and see where it goes and you're right think of i, I was with granddaughter and uh, over sunday or something and you know she's got you know apple stuff and iMovie, and it was amazing i mean I, I, she she made a movie in like 12 minutes yeah <laughs> you know? oh yeah it was easy it's crazy yeah i mean this is stuff we never would have dreamed I mean, of i mean she's 10 yeah, yeah, yeah. She's made, you know, a documentary film. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, it took Christine and I and, and Gloria Monaghan, I mean, how many months in our in our producer to put together our documentary film on Nancy Ellen Craig, daughter of Rubens, you know, and unfortunately got at the Provincetown Film Festival. Congratulations. But um, I was hopeful of that. You know, I mean, that was like hand cameras and sound machines that, you know, were carting around. And that little 10-year-old can do it and... 12 minutes times are changing quick yeah. uh, it's amazing i mean and i and i i'm happy to hear that that was entered and, and received well up in provincetown and um i am yet to see it uh -huh. so i need to see this yeah, yeah, yeah. um i'll put the link is it online now or is it only in physical yeah, copy I, I ask christine okay i'll <laughs> check with christine um who's also a great poet and author yeah. um i guess the, the big question is I, I guess all technology, I think their goal is at least 10x every year. I know that at least three or four months ago, they thought that chat GPT, GPT-4 was at the level of intelligence of Einstein, mm -hmm. which would mean that by somewhere around July or August of next year, chat GPT-5 will come out and it'll be about a 1500 or so IQ. Um, at that point, yeah. So the, the consideration is that we're not even going to understand how it's making decisions because we're just not smart enough. Right. Um, but, but remember, we're still the ones that have to ask the questions. But I think it's, as you were talking earlier, 
that one of the goals is that it starts to create on its own. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. Exactly. Telling us what we ought to do, what our behavior ought to be, what we ought to consume. You know, you really, you know, did you run your three miles today? You right. Know, what are you eating? Let's, let's, let's look at your diet. Oh my God. But I, I mean, there's, there's, there's potential great things and potential horrifying things yeah. that I think are, are really close. And we're talking next summer ish that we could have AI at that, yeah, uh, you well, know, it, level it, of intelligence. It already is at the level that I think it's ChatGP has four has five different voices, where you can create a persona to be your friend. If you're feeling lonely, for instance, uh, you know it's a right. cloudy day, you haven't seen the sun for you know days, and you're just not feeling yourself. That you can have a conversation with ChatGPT mm. with this person, and you can pick the voice. And they will ask you questions as well as you asking them about, well, how do you feel? What, why do you think you feel the way you do? And any life event happen and then you respond. Uh, I mean, that's scary. And remember, this yeah. is a machine that doesn't really have emotion or feeling. It has no moral code. That sparks an idea or a thought that I, you know, I, I read about this, that one of the things that they want AI to do is end of life treatment, but like therapy communication uh when somebody's in a home and they're alone and there's only so much that the human doctor can be around sure and now they have effectively a robot to talk to all day it's 24-hour hospice basically mm -hmm. um but they're thinking that this ai uh is a solution and i'm sort of like okay what is better to have it be a robot that's probably more attentive and thoughtful than a human would have been anyways that's also there 24 hours a day or the human that's like had a bad day that day and didn't really want to be there i don't know i mean so ooh, but that's just gives me chills thinking about it yeah um there's also i forget the name of the there's a culture of men in japan that don't go outside i'm trying to remember the name of it um, but that's a big thing for them is that the robots, they're looking forward to the robots. I know there's a name of that specific group and they, they're known in Japan and they like don't leave their home. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a problem, like it's a societal problem that they're not interested in this in being outside and meeting anyone, let alone a woman or a man or whatever, nobody. Mm -hmm. um, and this AI is going to only make that much more possible mm -hmm. uh, psychologically to actually maintain some level of, um, I guess, <laughs> mental health uh, with this AI that mimics a human mm -hmm. uh, and, and doesn't get mad or, well, let's hope. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, there may be limits to it. I, I have a couple of nieces that are to college, just getting out of college, and the one that just got out of college said, you know what, I'm done with Facebook. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm done with the social criticism, trying to compare myself. I need another path. I think we started this conversation about what brought you to the Cape. The water brought me to the Cape. Mm -hmm. You know, my fellowship with water and my love for water and water is my friend. Um, and we've talked about, like, God, this technology can be overwhelming. I like it when I don't have to look at my smartphone, you know, yeah. every other hour. So I think there's a part of us still that's drawn to nature, that's drawn to friendship with real friends that likes to play pickleball on tennis courts things like that i heard that you're an amazing pickleball player by the way i won't tell you who told me but i heard you're running the courts over here uh, i don't know <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know that, that's when you need to have verifiable truth yeah. uh, uh, i wouldn't doubt it <laughs> um, but I, I mean there's a part of us we're still human right i mean we're having this conversation we're connecting we're making eye contact listening to each other's voices and you know we're we're feeling good about sharing this conversation trying to educate ourselves and your listening audience and make them think about things that are important in their lives. But there are other things that are important in their life, their family, their children, their parents, you know, what they think about what's going on. And um, we're still humans and we still connect and we're social beings and we, we still need that. Um, so all is not lost. I, I we'll figure out this AI stuff. I hope hopefully. so. <laughs> yeah. Well, as you know, we're doing this in the back of the art gallery where your wife's book is in here, and uh, you know, we've got all this local art. And I just do have concerns for you know the future of all these artists and creators. And this is really an important conversation. And I, honestly, as things evolve, I'd love to have you back for a part two on just copyright is one thing, but also. Um, your extensive history, I mean, just the story of your life would be a good episode. Uh, I mean, a great episode, um, because again, 
you know, MBA from Wharton, uh, you know, basically uh, you're, uh, we're a circuit judge. Um, you are one of the most accomplished people I think I've ever met. Um, you know, you've got, you've been on PBS and GBH. You've been on, uh, I don't know how many championships you've won, but we're going to list them out in one of these episodes, <laughs> national uh, and world championships. Uh, and, you know, you just, I can't do it justice uh, in, in so short amount of time, but there's just so much that we could talk about. And I think people would really, I think especially as people are getting more lonely these days, it seems um, you've been able to, I think through sports, through being, you know, friends with Mark Spitz and friends with Michael Phelps and an extremely accomplished sh swimmer uh, and triathlete. Uh, you've been able to do things in your life that aren't monochromatic. They're not just one thing that you do. You do things across so many different aspects of what a person could do that keeps your life vibrant. And I think that's why I'd like to have you back just to have a discussion about the your experience through life and, and how you ended up going to five colleges and getting many degrees at high levels and then becoming a judge and all these other factors. Because, you know, now that I think the audience has gotten to realize, okay, this is an extremely credible judge, lawyer, and person. Um, the interesting things that you've done in your life that aren't necessarily about accolades, but, and you don't want to brag at all, but there are many that we could discuss of your achievements. I think that might be inspiring to people to hear because you've done a lot, but it's not about getting the accolades. It's about doing it and it's about living. And I, I mean, just going through all the different notes on all the things you've done, um, you've lived an amazing life and you're still very young and you're still wrecking people on the, on the pickleball court. <laughs> um, well, Thoreau said, live the life you dream. And I, and that's what I tried to do. Yeah. And have some balance, but, um, a lot of people help, you know, we, none of us do it alone. Right. You don't produce this show alone. You know, you don't run this shop alone. You're good at relationships, creating relationships and making people feel special. Mm. And uh, I think that's important. And uh, that's what I tried to do throughout my life. Yeah. Well, we will have you back. Well, thank you. My thank pleasure. you yeah. so much, Judge Jones. We'll have you back soon to do a part two and also other, other topics that we'll discuss. So I just want to say thank you so much, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Me too. That concludes my interview with Michael Jones, a.k.a. The Judge. Thank you so much, Michael. I'd love to have Michael back on to discuss pertinent topics and current events in the future. But even more so, and more importantly, I'd really love to cover his life story because I think it could be quite inspirational for people to learn about and to see how they can maximize their experience in life. Thank you so much, Michael, for your time, and thank you for sharing your expertise. If you like this episode, please consider supporting us on Patreon under the Cape and Islands podcast. Also, please send any feedback or constructive criticism, as well as any recommended topics or guests, to Podcast at gmail.com. Also, follow us on Instagram and YouTube by typing in at Cape and Islands podcast. Thank you so much for listening.